Climate change is posing a growing threat to people and their livelihoods in Asia and the Pacific. Last year alone, there were record heat waves across the region. India witnessed catastrophic floods, while Kiribati suffered from prolonged drought. The People's Republic of China experienced some of its heaviest rainfall in a century, and Australia grappled with bushfires and floods. In spite of this, global and regional progress on some climate-related goals continues to struggle mightily. Urgent actions are needed across Asia and the Pacific. These must consider unique climate patterns and ecosystems. They must also account for each economy's capacity to cope with the impacts of climate change and thus be informed by high quality data on climate change and policy actions. As Asia and the Pacific's climate bank, ADB is steadfast in its commitment to addressing the many threats posed by climate change. We're working to ensure a clean energy transition and enhance climate resilience in line with the Paris Agreement. In 2019, ADB committed to investing $100 billion in climate finance by 2030. This includes doubling our support for climate adaptation to better protect the poor and the vulnerable. To speed up climate action, it's important to make use of comprehensive and robust data and statistical frameworks. We need sound scientific definitions, standardized protocols, and statistical methodologies. These can help us collect data, conduct scientific research, and form effective policies. By bolstering statistical capacity across Asia and the Pacific to measure climate actions and outcomes, we can empower governments and communities to make informed decisions and develop more effective climate action plans. The 2024 edition of Key Indicators for Asia and the Pacific highlights an urgent need to quickly build capacity to produce climate change statistics. It also calls for further development of statistical methodologies for important climate change indicators. The report explains why precise, geographically granular data are essential to understanding climate change drivers and impacts and to design effective measures for mitigation and adaptation. Armed with high quality data and statistics, we can take evidence-based actions to shape a more sustainable future for Asia and the Pacific. Welcome to the Asian Impact Webinar, hosted by the Asian Development Bank. We are very delighted to have you with us today as we discuss our newly released flagship statistical publication, Key Indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2024. The report offers valuable insights into the region's socioeconomic and environmental landscape, including critical data and statistical trends that are shaping the future of Asia and the Pacific. During this webinar, we will present compelling evidence on statistical gaps in climate change data systems. We will also explore how we can better understand the implications of such gaps for vulnerable populations in developing Asia. We will emphasize the importance of granular data in capturing the nuanced impacts of climate change across different regions and communities. After the presentation, our panelists will discuss these pressing issues in detail. They will outline a range of policies and strategies aimed at enhancing data systems to foster inclusive and sustainable development with a strong focus on building climate resilience. At this point, let me walk you through the core messages of key indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2024. Let us start with the question, what do available data reveal about progress on climate action and where do data gaps exist? We have already crossed the halfway point towards the 2030 deadline for the Sustainable Development Goals. However, 
Asia and the Pacific, along with the rest of the world, are at a critical juncture. Our region lags behind on SDGs. Particularly concerning is our region's progress on SDG 13, which focuses on climate action. The data indicates a significant regression in this area, highlighting the urgent need for enhanced efforts and strategies to combat climate change and its impacts. And we can see mixed results if we break SDG 13 down based on available data. Under indicator 13.1.2, national governments across Asia and the Pacific appeared to be on track in 2023 for the adoption of National Disaster Risk Reduction or DRR strategies. However, the proportion of local governments that had adopted and implemented localized DRR strategies as measured by indicator 13.1.3, lagged behind the target for 2023. Furthermore, these policy actions do not appear to have reduced death or the number of those missing or affected by disaster as shown by data on indicator 13.1.1. Disturbingly, indicator 13.2.2 shows that progress on reducing greenhouse gas emissions went even further backwards. These findings underscore the need to galvanize our efforts to accelerate climate action. And as we do so, we must give particular attention to smaller and lower income economies to ensure that they won't be left behind, considering that they have limited capacity to cope with the adverse impacts of climate change. Additionally, we need to address limitations in availability of high quality data on several aspects of climate change. As we reinvigorate our commitment for climate action, there are two crucial challenges that we must navigate from a statistical perspective. First, it is important to identify what type of data should constitute the core set of indicators which national statistical systems must prioritize compiling because access to such type of information is crucial in deciding fundamental policies and programs. Second, it is crucial to strengthen statistical capacity of national statistical systems in providing high quality, timely, and granular data on key policy areas of climate change. Navigating these two considerations can lead to optimal use of resources available for many national statistical systems, particularly those developing economies operating with limited resources. And speaking about the need for high quality data, it is important to note that the statistical challenge does not simply stop at making data available. One aspect of data quality that we should also be concerned of is to enhance granularity. The Key Indicators Report focuses on one aspect of data granularity by referring to geographic or spatial granularity, which is defined by how finely the data are broken down by geographical area or unit. Precise data analysis made possible through spatial granularity is crucial for developing climate strategies that are accurately tailored to specific needs and vulnerabilities of distinct locations and communities. This is especially critical for Asia and the Pacific. Not only is the region more vulnerable to climate change risk than other parts of the world, but also the individual economies in the region exhibit great diversity in their exposure to risk and their capacities to cope with climate change. Granular data from non-traditional sources enable independent and frequent monitoring of climate change drivers. For instance, remote sensing technologies are used to track various greenhouse gas concentrations and to identify carbon sources in sinks across borders. On this slide, we employ NASA's high-resolution carbon concentration anomaly map and overlaid it with daytime satellite imagery to demonstrate how granular data facilitates the cross-border monitoring and management of CO2 sources and sinks. The white lines in these maps are national borders. In the left figure, shared forest reserves serving as carbon sinks, as indicated in blue, require collaborative management by both economies. 
Conversely, in the right figure, a carbon source, which is a power plant, situated near the border between two economies, con contributes to elevated levels of CO2, as shown in red and orange. Granular data is essential for ass assessing differential climate impacts across regions and communities. It allows us to pinpoint and prioritize areas most impacted by climate and to develop targeted and adaptive climate action plans. In 2023, human activities saw the average global temperature reach 1.45 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level, making it the hottest year on record within the warmest decade ever documented. However, the extent of warming varies by location. Here, we summarize the granular data on monthly temperature anomalies by economy. On the other hand, granular data on vulnerability to climate change may reveal the unique environmental, economic, social, and political challenges faced by diverse places and populations. This data is crucial for targeting regions that require immediate intervention and assistance, especially under budget constraints. As an example, these two maps shown on the slide focus on the parts of Thailand and the Philippines with relatively higher concentrations of poverty, but with varying levels of water risk. Poor communities are often disproportionately affected by climate change due to their limited financial resources to adapt or recover. By identifying localities where high water risk overlaps with severe poverty, Policymakers can ensure that resources are allocated not only to address environmental needs, but also to take into account socioeconomic vulnerability to climate change. In addition, granular data can help accelerate climate action on mitigation and adaptation. It helps policymakers distinguish regions that are well prepared versus those that are not, directing resources to underprepared areas. For example, mapping ele electrification rates alongside land use types may help identify potential areas for solar, G solar energy development. On this slide, we show a map of Mindanao in the Philippines where many rural residents face challenges accessing affordable electricity. Off-grid, environmentally friendly solar energy emerges as a viable solution in this context. By overlaying maps of electrification rates with land use data, we can pinpoint the most suitable locations for installing solar panels, particularly in economically disadvantaged area, thereby enhancing energy accessibility and supporting sustainable development. However, it is important to note that there's ample room to enhance the geographic granularity of data for a wide range of key indicators of environment and climate change. This chart exemplifies that issue. We have surveyed ADB member economies, national statistical offices, or NSOs, and the survey revealed that many NSOs identified significant gaps in the data granularity of indicators in climate change drivers, impacts, vulnerability, mitigation, and adaptation. Take the last row, fossil fuels, as an example from this slide. 22 out of the 29 participating economies that responded to the survey mentioned that data granularity for fossil fuels was at best only fair. And similarly, majority of the 29 responding economies rated most other indicators as only fair, um, like the fossil fuels. At this point, to cover how, we, how can climate-related statistical frameworks better support proactive policymaking, let me give the screen to my colleague, Yating. Thank you, Art. So to build better climate-related statistical frameworks, first of all, having a comprehensive national statistic plan is very essential. It ensures the availability of high-quality, timely data for informed policy making and monitoring development progress. Such plans also highlight the root causes of data gaps and the necessary actions to address them. This chart demonstrates that 
economies with a national statistic plan generally have better statistical performance across various metrics. However, our survey found that among 29 responding member economies, only 20 have a national statistic plan. The absence in several economies could be due to financial constraints, limited technical capacity, or underestimation of the importance of statistical infrastructure. Furthermore, in economies where data management is fragmented across agencies, creating a unified statistic plan can be bureaucratically challenging. In addition, strengthening climate data collection is vital. It allows national statistic systems to prioritize essential climate-related indicators. A climate change statistic program can help identify existing data, promote data sharing to avoid duplication, and enhance coordination among data stakeholders, improving resource and expertise utilization. For small island states, which are more vulnerable to climate change, there might be a greater incentive to strengthen their capacity to collect relevant data on the environment and the climate. However, this chart shows that much work is warranted when it comes to incorporating climate statistic compilation. Recognizing this, the international statistical community has developed the global set of climate change statistics and indicators. It is to offer a unified statistical framework that streamlines international reporting on progress towards climate targets. It also uh, guides national statistic systems in prioritizing data collection tailored to their social economic development context. It's important to note that each economy has distinct needs in addressing climate change. National Statistic Office and other agencies must customize their data collection strategies to align with their specific development priorities. Investment in human resource is crucial to developing effective climate change program, as a well-equipped human resource pool can drive the creation of robust, reliable, and relevant climate statistics. ADB's survey revealed some progress on this. Of the 29 NSOs surveyed in our region, 22 have dedicated teams handling climate or environmental data. However, only three are small island developing states, and just three economies reported having adequate staffing for climate statistics. This highlights significant staffing disparities, especially among the vast, most vulnerable areas. Integrating conventional data with innovative data and technologies holds tremendous potential for bridging gaps in climate analysis. For instance, this map estimates agricultural GDP at a granular level by combining tr traditional statistics and remote sensing data. It highlights areas with varying levels of agricultural production and rural economic activity. This data has been overlaid with climate risks to estimate hazard exposure and disaster risk profiles. It can also aid in designing, targeting, and evaluating rural development strategies and climate policies. The use of big data and technologies not only fills existing gaps, but also enhance our ability to respond to climate challenges with greater precision and timeliness. Moving forward, to enhance statistical capacity in climate change, it's critical to foster collaboration among governments, international bodies, academia, and the private sector. Given that climate issues often span multiple sectors, local units, and even cross national borders, it's crucial to establish a unified standard for data management to facilitate coordination and data sharing, both within and between economies. This chart shows that the priorities for enhancing capability in climate change statistics include interagency collaboration, standardization of indicators, methodological guidance, climate change surveys, financial resources, technical infrastructure, and the preparation of climate change reports. To summarize, our latest key indicators report underscores important findings 
about the current status of climate data in Asia and the Pacific. A significant number of national statistic systems in this region lack necessary data for effectively monitoring climate change and its impact. This limitation hinders economies from effectively managing their emissions, transitioning to renewable energy, and developing adapti adaptation policies. The situation can be improved by investing in monitoring systems, especially for the most vulnerable areas. Additionally, national statistic systems should leverage innovative knowledges and tech technologies to incorporate climate-related models uh, in census and surveys to better capture the effects of climate change on people's lives. With improved data, we can design more effective climate policies, which have the potential to save lives and protect our shared future. For more information, we encourage everyone to explore the key indicators report available at the following website. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jane. Thank you very much, Art and Yatin, for summarizing the key findings of this year's key indicators report. It has been truly insightful. Today, we are fortunate to have an exceptional lineup of panelists who can provide valuable insights and fruitful discussions on climate data-related issues. Briefly, let me introduce myself. I'm Jane San Jose. I work with the Department of Communications and Knowledge Management in ADB, and I'm pleased to be your moderator this afternoon. I encourage all of you to actively participate by sharing your questions and thoughts in the Q&A box. It is my pleasure now to introduce our esteemed panelists. Joining us this afternoon is Albert Park, the Chief Economist and Director General of ADB's Economic Research and Development Impact Department. Next, we have Margarita Guerrero, former Director of the Statistics Division at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. We also have Evelyn Wareham, Manager of Statistics Leadership, Governance and Use at the Pacific Community. And finally, we are also pleased to have Simon H. Olson, SDG Implementation Specialist in the Results Management and Aid Effectiveness Division at the Strategy Policy and Partnerships Department of the ADB. Again, if you have any questions, kindly enter them into the Q&A box as we proceed. And to our panelists, please feel free to jump in at any time with any pointers to help with the discussion. While waiting for questions from our audience, let's now proceed with engaging our panelists. Our first question to uh, Albert. The Asia and Pacific region is facing serious and wide ranging climate related challenges, including extreme weather events and rising sea levels. At the same time, however, its greenhouse gas emissions are still increasing. Albert, from your perspective, which do you think are the most pressing issues requiring urgent attention and action? Uh, thank you very much. I'm very excited about this year's uh, uh, KI report uh, on focusing on climate change data. Um, you know, that's a huge question because there's so many pressing issues. Uh, and one reason that it's so urgent is that Already, you know, we know 2023 was the hottest year on record. And so climate change has already happened to a great degree. And that means there's more pressure to urgently adopt both adaptation measures to cope with these changes, uh, to protect vulnerable groups, but also to mitigate, to uh, keep this from getting even worse. Um, so at ADB, you know, we're, as was noted in the introductory video by Warren Evans, we're really trying to balance our support for both adaptation and mitigation. Now, for adaptation, uh, you know, we have uh, areas which uh, are of great importance. One is uh, adjusting agricultural and food systems to changing climate conditions. You need to grow more climate resistant uh, crops. You need to use new technologies. You need to save water. There are many things that need to happen for those systems to respond uh, and maintain agricultural food production, which is, of course, very important for food security. 
Also, we need to prepare better for disasters. We need to respond better to disasters. So disaster pre preparedness and response is also an area of important emphasis, including uh, better, more responsive social protection systems. Another big challenge is sea level rise and coastal resilience. Much of the population in Asia lives right near the water and with sea level rising, it creates lots of challenges. And some of these challenges will require very large investments. Uh, some will require even moving people, moving populations in, or where people live, uh, especially in some of the Pacific islands. Uh, so these are some of the adaptation challenges. On the mitigation side, uh, we just need to uh, do better. We're not really hitting our targets uh, in terms of reducing carbon emissions globally. And Asia produces about half of global emissions. And one er one response to that that we're emphasizing quite a lot is making progress on better carbon pricing systems, uh, emissions trading systems, carbon taxes, et cetera. And these are now being adopted more and more by countries in the region. But uh, there's a lot of learning that still needs to happen and a lot of progress in expanding both the coverage and the uh, implicit price of carbon to uh, use pricing to accelerate change. In fact, some, many countries still even have fossil fuel subsidies, which are like a negative carbon tax, which are exactly the opposite of what we need. Um, and the other aspect of mitigation that is really important is the coal transition, because a lot of the large economies in the region, China, India, Indonesia, rely a lot on coal. And it's so cheap in many cases that it's hard to shift uh, to more renewable sources uh, for, for, for a number of reasons. And so this is an area where ADB has also been quite active to try to think about using blended finance types of incentives to uh, retire coal-fired power plants early using an energy transition mechanism, which is we're working on with Indonesia and now quite in quite a few other countries um, in the region. And finally, um, to really make all of the investments we needed for both adaptation and mitigation, we need to do better on finding enough finance for all the needed investment. And so we're really shifting very hard at A to B and thinking about how we can lend more ourselves to support action on climate, but also to work with the private sector and think about ways that our engagements with different countries in the regions can help them mobilize more private sector investment that can help uh, close these financing gaps. And that means really understanding the investment environment for private companies, both domestic and foreign, um, understand some of the price incentives in terms of the electricity grids and how um, they are managed, um, and also think about some of the other risks that really uh, still continue to be barriers for uh, private sector activity. So let me stop there and turn it back to you. Thanks a lot, Albert, for sharing what ADB has been doing in the areas of food security, disaster preparedness, and being inclusive in the sense that we are involving the private sector in our mitigation and adaptation efforts. Let me turn to you, Evelyn. You work with a you work a lot with the Pacific community, which is home to some communities that are highly vulnerable to the adverse impacts of climate change. Could you elaborate more on the gravity of the challenges facing small island states in the context of climate change? Absolutely. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to uh, be at the webinar today and my congratulations to the ADB for the key indicators uh, report on climate change. The, the results resonate uh, with our Pacific Island countries and territories and indeed with small island developing states around the world. Um, in the Pacific Islands, uh, climate change is considered to be an existential threat to the region. In 2022, Pacific Island Forum leaders declared that the Pacific is facing a climate emergency that threatens the livelihoods, security and well-being of its people and ecosystems. Small island developing states are particularly vulnerable to the impact of climate change. And that includes increases in natural disasters, uh, such as cyclones, uh, with both increasing frequency uh, and increasing intensity. Um, but as we saw in the highlights of the report, it also includes slow onset events, such as sea level rise or increasing drought um, in countries with limited uh, water supply like Kiribati or Nauru. 21% of the population in Pacific Island countries and territories live within one kilometre 
from the coast. Uh, so those communities are particularly vulnerable to sea level rise um, and to storm surges. Um, the ability for those communities to adapt and respond to the impacts of, of climate change is limited uh, given the scale of our countries. Uh, so uh, within the, the Pacific, um, our largest country, Papua New Guinea, um, has over 10 million uh, people in its population. Um, but many of our countries sit below 50,000 um, or even at 10,000 people. So they have limited resources to work with, limited capacity, um, and face economic constraints. Uh, to understand the vulnerabilities and needs of those countries and territories, as well as the options uh, they have for adaptation, uh, we really do need to expand the volume of relevant timely statistics that are required. Um, and that's the role that we play in my organization, the Pacific Community SPC, um, as the statistics leader among the regional organizations for the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Addressing these issues that Albert and Evelyn have alluded to requires robust statistical systems. Um, I remember this was being uh, pre presented at the introduction and high quality data to inform effective policies and initiatives. As noted in the key indicators report, there are several efforts to develop comprehensive statistical frameworks for environment and climate monitoring and reporting. Marge, could you shed more light on this matter by sharing your insights on the relevance of having comprehensive and up-to-date national statistics development plans and incorporating detailed environment and climate statistics development strategies into these statistical development programs? Yeah, thank you very much for... Um... The question, and um, I think partially the presentation uh, actually addressed uh, some of the issues that, with regards to why national statistical development plans or national statistical development strategies uh, are important and are relevant. Um, let me start by just, you know, defining very quickly what a national statistics development plan is. Uh, it actually, when you're doing this properly, provides a collective commitment by all stakeholders uh, to one, a medium term vision, two, detailed and costed action plans, and three, a comprehensive advocacy tool for steering statistical development in a country. For it to be relevant, of course, the vision and plans for statistics should be aligned with national development plans. The development priorities should dictate the priorities for strengthening and developing statistics. You ask why? In this day and age, we should already know why. Data and statistics, as uh, again, the, present, the earlier presentations has emphasized are crucial for informed decision-making, policy development, timely and targeted interventions, monitoring and evaluation, resource allocation, and accountability assignment. Therefore, when you're talking about climate action as a national priority, then strategies for enhancing environment and climate change statistics must be prioritized in development plan for statistics for this plan to be relevant. Well, but we're talking about NSDSs in general, but when we're talking about environment and climate change statistics in particular, there's specific challenges uh, that require new strategies. Uh, so when you're talking about integrating this into a plan for it to be relevant, uh, you need to think about new strategies beyond traditional data collection and analysis. And you've heard some of that in the report uh, just earlier presented uh, by Art and uh, Yatin. But just to list this again, um, let's name a few. For instance, you need a climate change statistics framework. And we've uh, already heard that uh, finally, um, uh, just about two years ago, a global set of uh, 
indicators has provided us a framework for climate change statistics. But actually prior to that, uh, there's been uh, regional frameworks, one from ECE that uh, have been developed. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, core set of climate change statistics uh, in Asia and the Pacific, the focus was on disaster related statistics. But for a national development plan, uh, the challenge then, and you've also heard it earlier, would be to adopt this to the specific mm -hmm. climate action that is needed for a country. We've heard about the need or strategies to integrate advanced data collection technologies like remote sensing, satellite data, Internet of Things. These are things that are not traditional for other types of statistics that are being developed. We would need to look into vulnerability indices and impact mapping so that we can measure climate change vulnerability and impact assessments. Um, we need enhanced data disaggregation. You've heard about granular data collection geographically, but we also need temporal granularity, for instance, strategies so that we're able to take measurements, provide statistics on a regular and high frequency level because climate change issues are, they don't happen every 10 years ago. We also need to have strategies that address the need for inclusivity in data collection and analysis. In particular, incorporating local and indigenous knowledge. And secondly, making sure that your climate statistics are gender responsive. And so there are quite a few strategies uh, that, um, um, uh, again, when you're talking about climate change and environmental statistics, uh, these are relatively um, new. Um, uh, you need to innovate, uh, you need to modernize. Uh, and so that is the challenge for making a national statistical development plan um, uh, relevant. Now in terms okay. of implementation, there are, two, there are three things I think that uh, needs to be incorporated in such plans. Again, relatively, new dimensions for a plan, the concept of data governance. It ensures that climate change statistics are managed with the highest quality, security, and integrity standards. And uh, there are many, and there are things that need to be done, um, uh, which I am not going to go into detail right now, but uh, um, uh, data governance, such as uh, standardization quality control, it's stewardship, dealing with security and privacy, integrity and accuracy. Um, when you talk about data sharing agreements, because there are very, very many sources of data now that you need for reducing climate change statistics. So then you need to take care of the data governance uh, issues. The second is uh, being agile and resilient, uh, develop, developing your statistical system for this. What does this mean? Remember the panic we had uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, its effect on statistical systems. Uh, and the lesson, hopefully, that we learned there is that we should always be in the state of preparedness when we come to statistics. And uh, this is also true in conflict situations when disaster strikes. So uh, when you talk about resilience, uh, it ensures that data operations continue despite disruptions. When you talk about agility, it allows the system to respond quickly in new demands and circumstances. And these are, the, you need to have strategies there, particularly because it's so important to producing climate change and environment statistics when they are needed. Right. You don't have the luxury of censuses, for instance. And finally, the last thing I think uh, for implementation is funding. Mm -hmm. um, in the survey by, uh, uh, I'm not sure, no, it's not the survey from uh, ADB, but uh, okay. Paris 21 putting together SDG indicator 17.18.3. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a great variety in the, there are plans, there are plans that are funded and there are plans that are not funded. So uh, for, that would then be the third uh, challenge for climate change. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marge. 
Uh, a study conducted by Paris 21 suggests that the statistical and data landscape is becoming exponentially larger and more complex, and there are gaps that need to be addressed. However, as noted in our presentation earlier, although several national statistics offices have a dedicated team handling environment and climate change statistics, the size of the team was deemed insufficient for a majority of those who participated in the survey that ADB conducted. Evelyn, could you share any relevant experience from the Pacific community regarding this matter? Yes, I mean, it's a, a huge challenge given the small scale of many of our national statistics offices in the Pacific Islands region. Um, so to give you some context, um, 10 of the NSOs in the Pacific Islands have less than 10 staff. Um, and only three have more than 100 staff. Um, so when you're working in an organization of that scale, um, your ability to set up dedicated teams or to develop skills and specialist areas um, is really quite limited, um, even though it would be a, a dream to have a large team in every NSO that could focus on handling environment and climate change statistics. Um, there are several gaps across the statistical system that are difficult for Pacific Island countries and territories to address because of their size. Um, and that's not just limited to the environment and climate change space. It also applies in the economic domain um, and mm -hmm. in areas like social inclusion, uh, gender and disability statistics. Uh, some of our national statistics offices are, are really working on innovative ways to address these gaps. Um, and their resourcing constraints. Uh, Vanuatu, for example, are using machine learning and data science to identify vulnerable communities um, and to um, fill the gaps uh, from more traditional sources. Um, and uh, my organization, SPC, and a range of other partner organizations, including ADB, um, provide support to small island developing states statistical systems. I think I saw in one of our questions in the Q&A, how does that interagency collaboration work? Um, within our region, um, we have a lot of very proactive partnerships between development partners, donors, um, NSOs, and their partner agencies. Uh, for example, in this space, their ministries for environment and for climate change. Uh, we provide support for the development, collection and dissemination of survey and other data, um, as well as training and hands-on technical assistance uh, for countries. We also provide uh, regional services and, and supplementation. Uh, for example, we run the Pacific Data Hub, which is a regional shared service to bring together data and statistics uh, from different small countries in the region and uh, provide dissemination support. So that's not required uh, within the, the smaller NSOs. Uh, we assist with the analysis and interpretation and production of reports. Um, and right now we're assisting countries to undertake household surveys on the impact of climate change and natural disasters. I think the, the indicators report mentions uh, that uh, surveys have been in the field in Kiribati um, mm -hmm. in combination with their household income and expenditure survey, as well as in the Cook Islands alongside their labour force survey. Uh, so we're currently building out that support to look at how we can increase the volume of data available by supporting the addition of core modules or the, the running of standalone surveys for different countries in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn, for the updates. Simon. May I invite you to share additional information based on your perspective on what's happening in other parts of Asia and the Pacific and the rest of the world? How are other economies navigating these climate challenges and improving their data systems? Yes, okay. Um, thank you, Mary Jane, for this question. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to try to also uh, address the question that was uh, posed in the Q&A on how statistical offices can um, speed up action on climate change and also, let's say, the sustainable development goals. Let me try to get to it. Uh, first, I mean, developing granular data on many aspects of climate change in this region is without a doubt important. And the 2024 KI report shows clearly why this is the case, not only for climate change, but also more broadly. 
we have seen examples uh, of uh, waste management and uh, soil condition, human health and energy and other important aspects. And as you know, uh, as was mentioned, SDG 13 is dedicated to climate action. Um, but I, rec I recall a study uh, when I read through the report, uh, I came to think of a study I was involved in, uh, in which we compared uh, 50 voluntary national reviews that countries in the region had prepared uh, on the sustainable development goals between 2016 and 2020, I think it was. And the report actually found that SDG 7 on energy and SDG 13 on, on climate action were among the highest in terms of indicators that were reported on. Um, but uh, meanwhile, even for, even for climate change, uh, qualitative indicators tend to lag compared to quantitative indicators such as on emissions. So things around policies, which policies are in place are not as well reported than the quantitative ones. Still, I, I think we should see how we can take advantage of this positive momentum in some areas of climate change uh, data to provide insights relevant other, to other SDGs as well, including as, as we actually heard, you know, on aspects of food security. So SDG two, um, human health or planetary health, SDG three and some of the, the environment related SDGs, SDG eight on economy and jobs and so on. Um, and then, you know, the careful analysis and skilled storytelling of this year's report, it shines through when you read it. And it would be great to see climate statistics and data gradually engage even more with other related sustainable development goals over time. Okay. This could be done in a different ways by associating climate data with other development areas, many of which, in fact, we can see reflected in this year's report in the slides that were presented um, by Art and Yu Ting just before. As the report also shows, innovative data sources and machine learning can complement the current statistical uh, system cost effectively. And that's also something that we are working or we're trying to promote uh, through our work in the SPD. Um, the second part of my response related, rela relates to what we do with the data. And maybe mm -hmm. that's uh, also helpful in trying to respond to one of the questions in, in the, in the Q&A. Actually, there are increasing examples of national statistical offices that are mandated to not only collect and synthesize data, but also to communicate it to the public, communicate it. In doing this, they, they, they can transform technical and complex information into more digestible formats. Because we must remember, not everybody is a data expert and not every policymaker is an expert on data. So effectively communicating SDG data in intuitive ways can make the data more useful for decision making. In that sense, the SDGs and their associated indicators and reporting processes, like the voluntary national reviews, actually represent a rich opportunity for countries and their data custodians to continue to improve data systems and communicate the stories that data convey. Of course, doing so requires resources and capacities, uh, a point that was uh, uh, made also in the slides before. Uh, uh, one additional example could be um, uh, you know, some countries uh, that have well-resourced statistical offices uh, sometimes undertake peer reviews in other countries and help them work together and check uh, how is, how's mm -hmm. the data uh, and what are rooms for improvement. So in that sense, if there is a broker that could establish such partnerships between countries that, that need some help, uh, that could also be another way to, to improve things. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. Um, so thank you for bringing up that interdependencies uh, that are really important to address climate change challenges. Um, I'll combine these two questions uh, from the Q&A chat with the next question for Marge. From your perspective, what specific actions can international and national statistical systems take to facilitate greater multi-stakeholder collaboration? Um, that interagency collaboration for enhancing climate change statistic capabilities. How do we, how, uh, can you elaborate more on this? How and why? And is there any good practice in the region? Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, what we call technical cooperation is being undertaken uh, um, involving uh, the engagement of national statistical officers or national statistical systems in, in, in general, and uh, the international statistical system or international organizations consisting of UN uh, organizations, uh, as well as multilateral banks, as well as um, um, uh, what I would call uh, international NGOs, uh, all working in the space of climate action. 
the quite a few were ongoing. Um, just for instance, uh, for the for adopting the global set of climate change statistics, then uh, that uh, is um, a set of indicators that countries there's countries that are trying to adopt that, and uh, um, uh, the UNSD and some of the regional. Uh, um, statistical uh, offices um, with the UN are actually helping countries uh, um, uh, look into that set and adapt it according to their own context. So, so that is one. Um, uh, in general, we're trying also, like I mentioned earlier, there are quite a few other statistics frameworks on climate change. And uh, in order for these, uh, to, there's a need for this to be harmonized. Uh, um, uh, there's a need for um, definitions to be comparable and consistent across uh, any set of statistics uh, and also uh, for comparability across countries. Um, and so there's also work on this and uh, technical cooperation that's being conducted uh, um, uh, that, that exists currently on this. Uh, um, um, I think um, because of the uh, importance uh, of climate action, uh, um, there's not, uh, it, it is not an issue in terms of uh, how uh, uh, organizations, national, international, regional, um, uh, are actually getting together in order to address uh, the needs for uh, the gaps uh, in, in, in feeding data that uh, was mentioned earlier by the, uh, in the presentation of, of uh, the key indicators. So, all right. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, finding out, uh, and and I think um, uh, with respect to uh, globally, the regional commissions of the UN with statistics divisions uh, that uh, could be a starting point. There's SPC um, uh, that uh, could be a starting point as well. And of course, ADB has its own uh, um, set of projects uh, as well as the World Bank. Uh, so there's there are many things that are ongoing right now. This. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Marge. Um, Evelyn, one of the points raised in the key indicators report is that the geographically granular data can help identify the most vulnerable communities and ecosystems affected by climate change. Uh, could you share specific experiences in the Pacific region in ensuring that the data that you are collecting are sufficiently granular? Yes, as I mentioned, SPC has developed a, a household level survey to measure particularly climate change loss and damage at a more granular level. Uh, loss and damage is a, a very key interest uh, for our countries. Um, they're, they're, most of the small island developing states don't have uh, large volumes of emissions. Uh, but they do have a, a high volume of impact and uh, granular data can provide the evidence base for climate justice cases and climate finance. Um, so the household survey has been designed to address data gaps and inform which areas need additional support uh, related to adaptation based on loss and damage. Um, but beyond uh, survey collection, um, we've also been exploring the use of Earth observation data, satellite data, um, such as the Digital Earth Pacific project, which brings together um, existing big data resources for the region to provide uh, truly granular data on, for example, coastline change, uh, both for atoll countries and for larger countries in the region. Um, the extent of mangrove, which protects uh, countries from coastline loss, um, and a, a range of other topics. And we'd see high potential to integrate those different types of information, satellite data, administrative data collections, and uh, survey collections to highlight areas of vulnerability for example, combining census data and coastline change data to show which communities are at higher risk of sea level rise. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Evelyn. We are five minutes, um, uh, almost three o'clock. So I'll just read the, the last two questions um, for this afternoon's webinar. Um, Simon, addressing climate change often requires balancing other vital development priorities, such as poverty reduction and economic growth. So how can high quality data and statistics help policy navigators, help policymakers navigate these trade-offs? 
Yes, thank you. I, I like the term policy navigators as well. It's a good one. Uh, I think we, we need to we need to get away from the narrative that the choice of combating climate change or supporting sustainable development is a zero sum game compared to economic development. Indeed, um, science is clear that if we don't take action to make our economies more sustainable and transition to gender equal green and blue economies in the region, then economic development and the important objectives of poverty eradication and human well-being will be jeopardized. The role of more granular data and statistics is more important than ever in this endeavor. This includes the generation and communication of data that shows that show how a green low carbon economy can benefit countries and people in many ways by job creation or improving human health, reducing lifestyle diseases, uh, reducing disaster risks and inequality, I mean, reducing inequalities. So data and statistics can illustrate those links between sustainability on the one hand and well-being on the other. Doing so will make the evidence base for just transition stronger so that it can be supported by the public and policymakers with interventions targeted at the people most affected by climate change. Indeed, thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we would like to be like more forward looking. So Albert, looking ahead, what are the statistical innovations that can enhance our understanding of climate change impacts at the local level? More particularly, how can we harness these advancements to drive more effective and inclusive climate action? Yeah, well, it's a very exciting time for data analysis. Technological change is, on the one hand, creating lots of new big data sources, including many of the data sources that have been mentioned by other panelists, remote sensing data, um, other types of sensors that are placed to measure pollution or water levels, et cetera. That all creates data. And then in addition, new technology is creating new analytic power. So most famously, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and trying to bring all of this together and keep up with the opportunities for evidence-based learning is very challenging, even for a large research department at ADB, let alone statistical offices um, in developing member countries. Uh, but that's really an important challenge to take to uh, address head on because there's so many opportunities to bring data to to inform the policy responses to climate change. And granular data is particularly important because you really need to know where the problems are, where the vulnerabilities are to have effective targeted approaches. So just a couple of examples. We have disaster forecasting, you know, using, as Evelyn mentioned, combinations of survey data, remote sensing data. Um, even other types of data like uh, uh, social media data, you know, if people are talking about something happening. Uh, all of those could be used to better understand what's happening with disasters. And of course, if we have good sensors and good forecasting models, we can predict where the disasters are occurring even before they happen and even provide social assistance quickly or even before the disaster actually hits to really improve outcomes. The other aspect is poverty. So we've been doing a lot of work in our department on poverty mapping using <clears throat> learning and big data sources, including remote sensing data. Um, and that has been used by some uh, countries to actually help target assistance where assistance goes. And if you think about climate change and vulnerability, you just think about overlapping a poverty map with a disaster vulnerability map. And now you can really see where are the poor really most vulnerable to these shocks? Because we know the poor tend to be more vulnerable to climate change shocks. So all of that requires granular data. All of that requires a lot of institution building on the, uh, on the, uh, on the part of statistical offices. We're trying to support that. Um, part of the institutional building challenges include, number one, protecting data privacy, even as we use more and more big data. Second is knowledge management. You know, we need to keep learning from our own experiences, our own mistakes, our own innovations. And we need to share that knowledge uh, with other uh, researchers or other statistical offices. You know, Simon had mentioned, you know, having some, having statistical offices help each other. We're doing that also in ADB as an intermediary. For instance, we have a project where we're bringing the Korea Statistical um, Department to help the Mongolia Statistical Department develop their data uh, capacity. Um, and so uh, maybe I'll stop there. I think it's an exciting Thanks. time, but uh, there's many challenges. Thanks, Albert. It is really an exciting time. 60 minutes really is not enough for us to discuss climate change statistics data. But uh, I was given the good news that we can extend for at 
please bear with us for another five minutes. So I'd like to raise two important questions from the audience. First question I would like to direct to um, Evelyn. Uh, what are the various kinds of granular data that countries ought to be collecting? And would improving the granular data collection require massive system systemic change? Are there countries in the region that are already doing a good job of it? Uh, so that granular data that, that countries need is, is both on the climate change uh, phenomena that are uh, striking them, whether that uh, be, in our case, uh, sea level rise, storm surge, cyclones, drought, uh, king tides, and so on, uh, but also on the impacts. Um, so as, uh, as Simon was saying, those impacts can uh, cover um, education um, in a, a country that's hit by a cyclone. What's the impact on a household's ability to get their kids uh, to the local school and how long are they out of the education system for as a result. Um, labour market and, and workforce issues, uh, impacts on vulnerable populations, impact mm -hmm. on household agriculture and, and fisheries production. Uh, so we can gather that if we're combining our climate change uh, analysis with some of our existing uh, household and right. economic surveys that gives a, a very rich source uh, for use. Great, thank you. Thanks, Evelyn. But the other question that we would like to raise is um, can National Statistics Office engage in collecting data related to climate finance or is collecting climate finance data a responsibility of other government offices? I. Uh, I would like to request for Marge insights into this question. Um, you, so we'll have to remember that we're talking about the national statistical system here. So um, in, in some cases, depending on how, what the setup is, uh, there would be there would be other organizations or other ministries who would be responsible for finances, particular and in specifically, for instance, for climate financing. So if we are talking about uh, ODAs, there's a department that takes care of that, who keeps, uh, who, who is responsible for, uh, who can produce the statistics for this, not necessarily the NSO. Thank you. Thank you, Marge. At this point, um, let me give each panelist the opportunity to provide any final thoughts on how we can accelerate progress in terms of climate resilience and sustainable development. Uh, maybe we can start with Evelyn, please. Thank you, Mary Jane. Um, to accelerate progress to create the evidence base that we need in this area, um, partnership is going to be absolutely critical. That's partnership within each government uh, between different ministries, um, partnership between organisations that support uh, developing countries in the region, so ADB, SPC, SCAP, and many others, um, but uh, also partnership between disciplines, uh, between our scientists and specialists and different domains and our statisticians. Uh, we can move forward if we move together. Thank you, Evelyn. Marge, a quick uh, sharing, F yeah. quick final and, remarks, please. Enhance data collection and integration, develop standardized metrics and report frameworks, and finally promote data accessibility, use, and capacity building so that uh, the data that's being gathered is actually utilized for targeted interventions with policies. Thank you, Simon. Any final words? I think most of the thing, I, I don't know, I mean, very good stuff has already been said. Data access, that means communicating data in a, in a way that makes sense to the public and to people. I think that's very important so that uh, um, people can understand uh, that, that there is that there's a need to transform towards low carbon economies. I think that's one. Uh, another one is partnerships, as what has been mentioned. In fact, uh, we, uh, we published a report with the UNDP and the UNSCAP uh, this year. Uh, it's called People and Planet Addressing the Interlinkage Challenges of Climate Change, Poverty and Hunger in the Region. So there are partnerships uh, working on the topics, uh, relevant mm -hmm. topics already. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. And of course, Albert, a few words from you, final words. 
Thank you. I just want to emphasize that to address climate change, we're going to have a hard time doing it effectively if we don't have good data. I mean, it's, it's just a very simple direct relationship. And so all of these uh, aspects of the data and statistical challenges are very important. I would really emphasize the need to harmonize how we define things, because if everyone's collecting data in a different way, it does become difficult uh, to link our, our understanding and to learn lessons across countries. The other thing is we just need to really invest in capacity building through partnerships and other types of um, efforts. And finally, you know, as is emphasized by our KI report this year, um, the importance of being ambitious and going out and trying to collect more granular data and more disaggregated data, because uh, it might seem daunting, but it's it really is feasible given existing data resources, but um, it will uh, really uh, lead to very high dividends. On that note, thank you, Albert. Thank you to all our panelists and our particip participants in this in this afternoon's webinar. I'm sorry that we extended a bit. Uh, before we conclude, we encourage everyone again to explore the key indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2024 report. Uh, the link was shared in the chat box. And before we close today's webinar, we would like to invite you to join our next Asian Impact Webinar on Statistical Data and Metadata Exchange for Enhanced Data Management to be held on 12 September 2024, Thursday, 9 to 10 a.m. Manila time via Zoom. Please do check out the Asian Impact Webinar page and the Chief Economist's X account for more updates. Thank you, everyone, and see you again. We look forward to your continued engagement and wish you all the best in your endeavors. Good afternoon.